On 23rd April last, a riot took place here in Southall. The riot was a direct consequence of a National Front meeting held on that day in Southall, which the police decided to protect. In the ensuing chaos, hundreds were arrested and one man was killed, Blair Peach. Understandably, attention so far has concentrated on the death of Blair Peach, rather than on the 342 people arrested and charged on that day. More than three quarters of those men and women have been Asians from Southall. Every morning, those on trial that day arrive here at Southall Rights. They are met and advised by a member of the Southall Defence Committee. They are then taken to Barnet Magistrates Court, over 20 miles away, and tried. Over 70% have been convicted on evidence which, to say the least, is open to criticism. Now, as the trials draw to a close, we show the way that those trials and those convictions have shattered the mood of the Southall Asian community, and we point out the consequences it could have for us all. Southall in the 60s. In the previous five years, several thousand Indians had arrived from the Punjab. They came to work in the factories. They opened up their own shops and their children started to go to local schools. And very quickly, they set up their own political organization to defend their interests, the Indian Workers Association. The early leaders of the IWA were men who had already made a radical name for themselves in India. Vishnu Sharma was a lifetime Communist Party member with a history of militant activity in trade union and anti-Raj movements. Piara Kabra, a well-known student leader in India, he came to England in 1959 intending it as a stopover on his way to America. He never left. Savul Gill, he arrived in 1962 and quickly became president of the IWA. He too had previously been a student leader in the Punjab. When I came here, I met some old people who were known to me during student days and the IW elections were very near and uh, they rather persuaded me to take active part in the IWA so that the IWA, we could give shape to, an ID, to the IWA to become a sort of community organization. Right from the beginning, actually, the Indian Workers Association had one main objective was that uh, it should give any fight against any sort of racial discrimination. That was the main purpose of the organization. The IWA's early fights against discrimination often took radical forms. The best example is a six-week strike they organized with the TNGWU against Southall's main employers of Asian labor, Wolf's Rubber Factory. Indians had to pay bribery to get employment in the factory. When they went inside, they found uh, conditions which were not uh, conducive to work. At the same time, they had to uh, bribe again to the foreman and the um, charge hand for getting overtime work because wages were so low. They were comparatively paid less wages than the white workers. So we had to uh, educate people to uh, get their maximum support to organize unions in different factories. The IWA sustained the strike by persuading shopkeepers to give the strikers credit. Simply we give them uh, the groceries on credit, so whenever they require, when they go on back, they can uh, pay it uh, later on. Are you charging them uh, interest? Uh, no, no interest at all. Isn't this costing you a great deal? Uh, not much, but still we, it's about 150 or 200 pounds uh, a week. 100 pounds a week, which is, well, so far about what, 800 pounds? Uh, around about uh, 600 pounds. And so how, do you, how do you manage to, to, to pay this? Uh, because uh, we got uh, banking facilities, so we got uh, bankers overdraft, that's why we can pull on. You telephone, you can telephone any office. Although they lost the strike, this activity brought the IWA tremendous support. A year later, in 1966, they were able to purchase the Dominion. By then, they had a membership of over 2,000 and managed to raise enough money to buy this huge cinema from Mecca. It was an investment that was to pay off. Showing Indian films seven days a week to packed audiences, the Dominion Cinema soon became the major source of income to the IWA. 
Now, it brings in over £200,000 a year, making the IWA one of the richest ethnic organisations in the country. The more the IWA became part of the establishment, the more its campaigns were waged at national and international level, like the campaign against virginity tests on Asian women carried out by immigration officers. In the earlier part of this um, year, an Asian girl who came from Delhi had to go through this and the IWA took this case very strongly and with the help of very many anti-racist and uh, democratic organizations and people, not only in this country, but also in India, it, this case drew international publicity and the matter was raised in the Indian Parliament and uh, British Parliament. And so in two days' time, the Home Secretary had to say that in future these sort of tests will not be taken. In India particularly, there was very big uproar and uh, in the Parliament, even the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Mr. Bajpai, had to pay tribute to the Indian Worker Association South Hall for doing all this. But the more the IWA, under leaders like Gill, became a national and international body, the more distant it grew from the streets of South Hall, and so did the leaders themselves. Sadhul Gill became the first Asian Labour councillor. A year later, he became a JP, and shortly after that he went into business, first buying a hotel in Earl's Court, and later opening an insurance agency. Piara Cabra opened an off-licence. He also became a councillor and JP. Vishnu Sharma stayed in the Communist Party, but became influential in race relations circles throughout Britain, writing and being interviewed constantly in the press. But while the IWA and its leaders were prospering, life on the streets they had left behind them was beginning to change. During the late 60s and early 70s, racial attacks were becoming commonplace. In 1976, the violence culminated in the death of this man, Gurdeep Chugga, stabbed on a South Hall street by white youths on his way home from a religious festival. His death touched a chord in Asian youth. They surged onto the streets demanding action. To their anger, their elders in the IWA did nothing. They did not even cancel a conference they were holding that weekend. The IWA, on that very day, uh, when young people were talking about uh, some sort of action, they were having a meeting where basically what they were doing were squabbling over their internal differences and, and over petty politics uh, of back home uh, related to Indira Gandhi. Uh, and, you know, that's the kind of sort of thing we are talking about. Therefore, the only credit I can give uh, to the Indian Workers Association is that they have been responsible for the formation of, of South Hill Youth Movement. It's their inability to deal with the situation that uh, the movement in the first instance was, was formed. Young people felt so much more strongly because they had experienced a different, nastier form of racism than their parents had ever had to deal with. Unlike the older generation, most of them had spent their childhoods in Britain. Balraj Purewal had lived in Southall since he was six. We went to Domerswell's school and we were the sort of uh, the first influx of Asians in that school at that time, uh, in the mid-60s. And through the years, uh, the normal process uh, was that instead of uh, education, it was really sort of, uh, we were sort of, uh, fighting sort of racist attacks most of the time. Uh, it was terrifying sort of going from one classroom to another classroom because it meant going through various corridors. And there was always this element of fear of being attacked in the corridor, corridors itself. Hari Sandhu had gone to a local secondary modern, Featherston High. Hari Sandhu, you protected Raj when he was at school. What prompted you to do this? Well, we found at that time that at Domerswell School, which is in Southall, the young Asians were being picked up after they left school, finishing school, and they were beaten up on the way home. 
And uh, at that time, the elder boys thought it would be best to escort them home and save them a beating. Out of that anger and frustration at Chugga's death, the younger generation formed the Southall Youth Movement. They took possession of this building in Featherston Road. First, they simply squatted here, but later they bought the building and began to do it up. After squatting in the premises, uh, we were left uh, uh, on our own uh, to find the funds in order to maintain the building. And we, we did this by doing our own charity film shows, concerts, membership, etc., etc. Uh, we involved a great deal of membership. By now, a lot of these young Asians faced yet another problem their elders hadn't encountered. The recession of the late 70s meant that many couldn't find jobs. Again, it was the SYM, not the IWA, who stepped in with practical help. Because this building was to be the focal point for the organisation, it had to have certain projects. Uh, we based the weightlifting and physical training club, which involved the local uh, kabaddi players. And it was a substantially big project in that there were some 40 or 50 young people that participated. And there were other groups that came in the building. We had projects like literacy and numeracy, carpentry workshop, motor mechanics workshop that, that were encouraged, uh, and the sort of drop-in center. Perhaps it was the emphasis on sport and weightlifting. Or perhaps it was their street fighting past. But in spite of all this good work with young people, the Southall Youth Movement continued to be seen in the town as a bunch of young tearaways, not as a serious political organisation, until the Anti-National Front riot on April the 23rd, 1979. That riot had the effect of an earthquake on the political landscape of Southall. When the dust had settled, the IWA, like many of the demonstrators, seemed to have got trampled underfoot. First of all, address them and tell them that they are causing obstruction, and if they remain here, they're going to be liable to arrest. It was the SYM who now dominated the scene. This process, in fact, started long before April the 23rd, with a difference of opinion over tactics. The youth movement had always wanted to challenge the National Front, but the IWA had advised against it. The Indian Workers' Association executive was of the view that um, by ignoring the National Front, We'll be helping. Um, uh, we'll be helping that element uh, who is trying to oppose their presence in Southall. Because if we oppose them uh, in a different way, we will be perhaps uh, giving them more publicity. And uh, uh, the National Front was actually interested in getting more publicity. They were not trying to get anything else out of it. So we thought that uh, to avoid giving them more publicity, we should ignore them. After the riots, the reaction of the IWA was confused. Some of the IWA leaders were involved in a fund, created several weeks later for the hundreds arrested. But the official IWA fund wasn't set up until October, six months after the riots. We actually did decide to launch it before the elections of the Indian Workers Association. But as it is, uh, it wasn't a suitable time. Each individual group and individuals was split among themselves. We couldn't start this uh, fund at all. Following the riots, the hundreds of Southall Asians charged were sent for trial at Barnet Magistrates Court. The IWA were criticized for not sending representatives regularly to Barnet. 
some of the members went to um, Barnet Court and um, our president uh, had been there a number of times. I, but as you were general secretary of that executive, um, did you, were you going to Barnet? No, I didn't go to Barnet, no. Vishnu Sharma made the token gesture of coming to Barnet Court, having his photograph plastered in the paper the next morning. That is the only time I've seen any member of the IWA in court. I have never seen any member of the IWA sitting inside court, uh, whether it be the old executive or the new executive. They've done nothing. They don't, I, I don't even suppose, I don't suppose that half the executive knows where Barnet Court is. The Southall Youth Movement's approach has been quite different. They set up the Southall Defence Committee immediately, and every day, one of the SYM's men on the Defence Committee, Kapil Judge, helps organise the cases. Name? Sidhu. 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 And what's the... What, 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 what happened to the case? I mean, the, did the barrister perform OK? The barrister was OK. What happened was that uh, he's alleged to have knocked a copper on the floor. Mm. While he was on the floor, kicked him, made his nose bleed, yeah. bruised knuckles. I mean, you know, you, um, just, well, you just have to read it there. I mean, it's beyond belief. Who was the solicitor? In? It was a new one. It was uh, Baron Goff or something. Foreign sounding name. First time he's appeared at Barnet. If he got three months, I would really say there's no point in him appealing. Because, I mean, some of the other cases, mm -hmm. look at it. I mean, something really the SYM have monitored and publicized the cases in detail, and this seems to have paid off. They have noted that the severity of the sentences appears to have suddenly declined halfway through the trials. As a result, the Southall community began turning to the SYM for help and away from the IWA. Yeah, I was charged there with uh, GB, uh, ABH, which is uh, actually Barley Home, so and uh, built for damage of police property. And after you've been charged, where did you go to for help? Uh, I came straight to South Rights. See, do, why did you not turn to the Indian Workers Association then? Well, <clears throat> during all day on the 23rd of April and the history of the IWA, uh, I, not one single person or their executive member or their IWA person I've seen on the street. Not one. And I knew the IWA is not going to help anybody. The impact of the SYM on Southall politics became clear last November when the Indian Workers Association held its elections. For the first time ever, leaders of the SYM, like Purewal, felt strong enough to stand for election. And the old IWA leaders almost fell over themselves trying to woo the youth movement candidates onto their tickets. These eventually teamed up with Sardul Gill, I think South Hall Youth Movement has uh, uh, captured the leadership of the youth mainly in this area and they identify themselves with the so uh, South Hall Youth Movement in general. Um, but I think the most important thing now they have to do is to, uh, to widen their scope of leadership and become, involve themselves in community activity and become the leader of the community as a whole because I see them a very great potential for the fu future community leadership in this area. Even more significantly, the party which eventually won the election, headed by Cabra, had also offered Purewal a place in their team as Assistant General Secretary. What I think is that um, uh, particularly Mr. Purewal um, is a young, intelligent man. He has got experience of working with the youth he understands their problems. He can contribute more by being in one of the biggest organizations in this country than by being in his own small organization and waving his own little ban. Uh, I think that uh, he can contribute more by being in this organization, which has got uh, hundreds and hundreds of youth as its members. So if he comes into the organization, he will have uh, more chance to involve himself. Whatever he wants to do, 
and how he wants to help the youth. He will have the backing of the organization. He will have the support of the leaders of the community. He will also have the support of the community. But Purewal doesn't want to be co-opted into the establishment. For him, the elections were a dry run. The sole reason for participating in the recent Indian Workers Association election was so that we could learn the machinery by which these people uh, operate because quite clearly we have to uh, one day ourselves participate and take over uh, the organizations like Indian Workers Association. Uh, but before we are in a position to do that, we have to know the wheelings and dealings and the machinery and the backstage uh, canvassing that goes on. So in order to do that, myself and Grimail uh, participated uh, in the IW election. So the SYM are convinced that politically the future belongs to them. April the 23rd has given them the impetus they need. It's just a matter of time, they say, before today's leaders are ousted and they take over the reins of power in Southall. The, the days of the Indian Workers Association are numbered unless its leadership changes drastically. Because we are talking about the leaders who've been there for 20 years. We have seen no new face in that. Their philosophies, their, their ideas are 20 years out of date. If the IWA does eventually come under the control of younger men like Purewal, it will mark a major change in Asian politics. We would all have to adjust to a new and possibly more aggressive organisation.